And now I'd like to uh, share with you a, a beautiful passage of Scripture uh, that really describes the nature and the relationship between us and the world. I know this is, uh, seems kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around something like this, but Jesus addre addresses it directly. This comes from uh, John chapter 15, and we'll be starting with verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember when I told you a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they would obey yours also. They will treat you in this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I, come and if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they have, they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not come among them and done no, uh, and the works that no one else did, they would, have, they would not be guilty of sin. But as it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what was written in the law. They hated me without reason. May the Lord have blessing to his holy word. And now we're about ready to enter into a time of teaching, so I invite you to turn your attention to the screen. Well, this morning we started a brand new message series called God Never Said That. Uh, today, the, during this uh, whole series, we're going to be taking a look at uh, these kind of expressions that have now permeated our culture that we believe are from God, but truly they're not biblical at all. So as we take a look at all these things that God never said, I hope that this will help us to rethink some of these things that we hear all the time. Uh, for instance, today we're going to be dealing with uh, the thing that God never said is God wants you to be happy. How many people have heard that? That, yeah, God, surely God wants you to be happy, right? Uh, well, that's one of those things that really isn't the case. In fact, there are many common sayings that are just simply not biblical. Uh, let me see if I can come up with, with one that you'll understand. Maybe, oh, I know one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. How many people have heard that before, right? That anybody? Yeah, okay, come on. If you're online and you've heard that before, type in, yes, I've heard that one before. But how many people know where that came from? It did not come from the Bible, no siree. That became a part of our normal culture, an expression that we all hear all the time because of, wait for people, ivory soap. Go figure. It became a slogan as an advertising campaign, and that's why we hear it today. But you realize that that is not in the Bible. Now, that, that does not mean that God praises dirt and filth, right? Just because it kind of seems very close to what God might say, that doesn't mean that that's what God really said. Well, today we're going to be taking a look at... Uh, uh, the idea that God wants us to be happy, but the truth is, your happiness is not God's top priority. And that's the things that we need to look at today. 
So as we uh, jump into this uh, whole series of taking a look at the things that God never said, we need to uh, understand what uh, the difference is between what God promises and the things that uh, are sometimes okay for us, sometimes not okay. The issue at stake here today is God di doesn't promise happiness. Now, did you catch that? God does not promise happiness. He's not opposed to being happy. Okay, give me a little nod. Are you with me? And the difference that? It's okay to be happy, but God never promised that as a reward for being a Christian. And I think that's part of the struggle, is that there are some people who become a Christian, they find out that their life is no better. Sometimes they find their life is worse only because now their normal friends and family don't really want to associate with them. And they'll say, hey, wait a second here. I'm worse off. I'm no happier. And then they abandon the faith instead of realizing, God didn't promise you that. That's one of those things that it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around. Because after all, the things that we want, surely God would provide. I mean, we do know that God does provide, but not necessarily those things that make us happy. What God does promise us, by the way, is way more important, way more powerful than a mere emotion of happiness. You'd be surprised how many times throughout Scripture God does promise us comfort, peace, fulfillment, even real joy that is separated from the emotion of happiness. So that's really what we're going to be looking at today, is what are those differences and what does God really promise us in the end? Well, first of all, let's understand that uh, just because you follow Jesus does not mean you're going to have a happy life. Um, in fact, God doesn't even promise it'll be an easy life, an easy decision. In fact, what Jesus does tell us is that following Christ comes at a price. If you're going to follow Christ, there's a price attached to it. And sometimes that price is really a less happy life. No, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Now, God does not make you unhappy, okay? Sometimes you're unhappy because God is trying to make you a new creation. And if God is trying to make you a new creation, maybe that transformation process is a little uncomfortable. And that discomfort may lead you to believe that you're not as happy as you used to be. That's when our enemy gets in there and starts whispering, why are you doing this anyway? If you're not happier, why don't you just give up this whole thing and go back to the way you were? Instead, we need to really understand that Jesus knew even back then that there was a cost to following him. You know, Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, which is a, a powerful sermon to thousands of people, he said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way or the road that leads to destruction. Oh, isn't that a terrible thing to say? Whenever I read this, my heart just pounds a little bit. And every time I preach this, I get a knot in my stomach. Jesus says, enter to the, in, through the narrow gate, which is fine, right? But then he says, wide is the gate, easy. Broad is the way or the road, easy. But that leads to destruction. And then he says, and there are many who will go in by it. There will be more people who will take the easy way that lead to destruction. But because the narrow, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And because it is a difficult way and Jesus never promised us anything else but a difficult journey, there will be few who find it. 
as I look out at the people here today, and I'm sure there are many people who are watching online right now who might be thinking, do I have a difficult journey? Has my path been difficult? Have I had to deal with those slight persecutions and those tough transformational aches and pain? I hope you have. I hope your journey's been a little rough, honestly, because that means you're probably on the right path. Am I right here, folks? Am I right? Of course, that often begs the question, and I don't want anyone to respond except in your own heart. But has your journey of Christianity been so easy that maybe you haven't really been too active on the whole transformation front? See, God never promised us happiness. What he did promise us is transformation. What he did promise us is a new life. What he did promise us is to be changed from the inside out. That's the nature of the gospel. It isn't the nature of the gospel to give everyone uh, riches and joy and happiness and all those things that the world has to offer. In fact, he says, once you decide to join me, it's not going to be an easy road at all. In fact, there's this one guy who actually said to Jesus, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And his answer was astonishing. As he was walking along, a, 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 a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, knowing very well the nature of his heart, knowing very well the level of comfort he wants, and knowing very well deep down inside of him that this journey was going to be hard, and Jesus knew he wouldn't make it. So he said, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. He said to him, are you sure you want to follow me? Because it's going to be a hard road. Then he said to another man, follow me. But uh, he said, first let me bury my father. Now that's a reasonable request, don't you think? My father's dead, we just need to take care of this. But keep in mind, at this stage... It wasn't as if the funeral procession was walking by and he said, Jesus, I'll be with you this afternoon at 2 o'clock. The truth of the matter is that was an expression to say, my father's not dead yet. Once he's dead and buried, then I'll come and follow you. Jesus replies, let the dead bury their own, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. That's not an unreasonable request, is it? To run back and tell his family to say, hey, I've met Jesus and I'm going to follow him. I don't know if I'll ever see you again, but I love you. Bye. But once again, Jesus looked inside the heart of that person and knew very well that he longed for the comforts and the happiness of home more than following the rough road that Jesus had in store. So Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand on the plow and keeps looking back, looking back at his past life, looking back at the life that was comfortable, looking back at the family that he would miss more than Jesus is not fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Hmm. Jesus makes it pretty clear, doesn't he? If you decide to follow him on this wild road of discipleship, it won't be easy. First of all, Jesus never promised it would be easy, and he never promised you a life of happiness. What we need to do is remember that he promised us way more than just the motion of happiness. 
Unfortunately, it's hard for us to see that because we are immersed in the world. You know what I mean? We are immersed in the world, and the world is offering us all kinds of things that uh, are, they're willing to make us happy. If we only had this, if we only had that, if we only had the latest cell phone or a brand new car, if only we had nicer clothes, if only we lived in a better house, if only we lived in a nicer neighborhood, if only I could go on vacation like everybody else, next thing you know, it's easy to say, I want all these things of the world that will get in the way of Jesus. We need to be careful of the world, right? Because what the world offers us will never last. Am I right here, folks? It'll never last. And we need to know that Christians do not belong to the world. Our source of happiness, our source of joy, peace, power, understanding, fulfillment in who we really are comes in Jesus, not in the world. The world specializes, if you will. The world focuses in on trying to make us happy in that materialistic, emotional sense to make you happy. For heaven's sakes, has anyone ever seen a television commercial? ever what do you think they're promoting unless they want you to sue somebody then they'll try to make you sad other than that if they want to have you buy something people are outrageously happy i mean come on i saw just recently i don't know a few days ago a ridiculous burger king commercial i'm not saying we shouldn't shop at burger king i'm not saying anything about our local friendly establishment whatsoever however this commercial just happened to be the epitome of so many other commercials okay it all starts out with these three or four people driving to the drive through at burger king clearly ordering whopper sandwiches they get them into their car and they say, oh, wow, two big Whoppers for only $5. I'm going to leave before you change your mind. This is the most thrilling experience I've ever had. They ordered it. There's a menu. They knew exactly what they'd be getting. But the commercial wants you to believe that true happiness comes in a Burger King sandwich. I think Jesus has more to offer you, doesn't he? That's what we need to realize. That we're not a part of the world. Nor should we. We've never meant to be in our, or of the world. We've got to be here, right? But we can't let the culture dictate who we are. If we do... We're going to miss out on Jesus. Now, if you think that's too heavy of a statement, Jesus said it himself. I'm not making this stuff up. It's unbelievable how Jesus laid it down so plainly and powerfully. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If, you, if uh, you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, for I have called you, I've chosen you, I have grabbed you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Have you ever felt like you're just not getting along with the world and the culture? Have you ever seen the culture pass you by and you might be thinking, I just don't get it. What's going on here? I think it's probably because deep down that still small voice of the Holy Spirit is whispering into your life things such as this happiness that everyone's chasing after is fleeting. It's only for a moment. Now, I'm not making fun of anyone in particular because I don't know them. I was just going through uh, Walmart, pushing my cart and trying to find the right thing, going right by the list and trying to get everything done. And it just so happened that walking just a few paces behind me was this family. And I'm sure it's a perfectly lovely family, okay? 
but there was a teenage girl, and I'm not making fun of all teenage girls, okay? <laughs> but she was whining, whining, because she doesn't have the latest iPhone, okay? And finally, they passed me because I was comparing prices as a cheapskate that I am, I'm doing. And then I saw her, and she was pointing to the phone, showing her mom, Mom, this is only an iPhone 8, and look, it's so small, and the screen is cracked, and it's just terrible. Why can't I have a new iPhone for Pete's sake? Everyone has a new iPhone. And at a certain point, either I wanted to laugh or run away. So I ran away. <laughs> Not quite, but I had to turn. And it just dawned on me at that moment, her happiness, clearly the difference between absolute happiness, sheer joy, and ultimate misery for her lay upon a new iPhone. At her age, the only phone we had was attached to the wall on a short cord, and you didn't speak it into and say, hey, Siri, call home. You had to do this. See, I wonder how many people remember this. Right? Oh, my goodness. And that was just 50 years ago. Now, my dad, 50 years prior to that, when he had a phone, do you know what he had to do? Ring, ring. Yeah, you're already doing it. So two rings, then three rings, then one ring meant uh, he could. That was, for those of you who don't understand that, how many people understood that reference anyway, by the way? All right, if, you, if you're online, tell me you understood that. What that meant is a party line. And each time you rang the bell, everyone had a certain rhythm. So uh, for them, it was ring, ring, ring. Oh, no, ring, 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 ring. So it was uh, two, three, one. That meant they, they could pick up the phone and say, hey, it's me, blah, 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 blah. But of course, anybody else who was on the line could also pick it up. 50 years before that, when my, when my grandparents were kids, no phones. Isn't it funny that in the span of just that short period of time with such a limited technology, the target for happiness is a moving target. You see what I mean here, folks? The world offers us a moving target. The world says as soon as you achieve some degree of happiness, we're going to up the ante. So what you had before is now the utter misery of life. That little girl with the cell phone at one time is a brand new cell phone, the latest technology. You see what I'm saying? And now the most ultimate joy-filled experience is nothing but utter misery. That, my friends, is what the world has to offer. The question here, the, the, the real question at stake, when it all boils down to it, if you were thinking of just the emotion of happiness, what do you need to make you happy? The question at stake here is, what do you need to make you happy? I want to make one thing very clear, okay? God doesn't want us to be unhappy. Did you hear that? Just because God never promised us a life of happiness, God does not say in order to be a Christian you need to be miserable. That's not it. All we're talking about here is that slight difference between the emotion of happiness, which God never promised, and the idea that, well, if God never promises that, he wants us to be miserable. I've known a handful of Christians throughout my years uh, who it feels like that their job in life as a Christian to be long-faced, dour, and miserable. And by golly, if I'm going to share the gospel, I'm going to make everyone as miserable as I am. Okay, I'm, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But I know some people actually feel guilty about having anything nice. Christians, good, solid Christians. I'm also here to say that 
It's okay if you get a new car, a new boat. It is totally okay if you have all these other things that the world has to offer you. I mean, for Pete's sakes, I don't live in the Stone Ages. Frankly, I have my own creature comforts. When it's cold outside in the middle of Minnesota winter, I like heat. Don't you? And you know, I happen to live in a house where I don't need to dig up coal out of the earth or cut down a tree and throw it to make a fire. I have a little button that I push and all of a sudden, brrr, the heat comes on. Is that a nice thing that our world has to offer? Of course. Here's the difference though, folks. Can you you got to hear me on this. Got to hear me on this. My source of happiness is not found in my furnace. Are you with me on that? My source of happiness is found in the Lord. True meaning, contentment, fulfillment. I don't know how many people have ever been here um, since I've been in this church and been at a funeral. Those can be very sad occasions, right? I got to tell you, it was my utter joy, and I mean that with all sincerity. I felt joy at preaching Kurt's funeral on, on uh, Friday. I wasn't happy that he was dead, right? But number one, I got to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Any day I get to share Jesus is a good day. But at the same time, most of the people who were in the room that day felt joy, even though they had tears of sadness. And that's because Kurt made a great profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And I know the promises of God are not just sheer happiness, but the promises of God are eternal life. The promises of God are filled with the greatest blessings imaginable. And me as a mere human being here on this earth, I had the joy of sharing that good news. And the family had the utter joy of knowing the truth of the gospel. These are way more tangible than whether you have a new car. As we uh, take a look at John, this is uh, Jesus speaking in the book of John. As I've told you these things, so that you may, so you may have peace. Now, isn't peace a whole lot better than just that emotion of happiness? But Jesus does something very interesting here. He says, I've told you these things so that you may have my peace. In this world, you will have trouble. So he's saying, here you are on earth. You're doing your thing. You're trying to be a Christian. He explains all of this to his, his disciples. He says, I hope all this will bring you joy because this comes from me. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome all those things that will distract you. I will overcome the world and bring you something that the world cannot offer you. The world offers you nothing but mere happiness happiness and a smile on your face. The world offers you something that is only uh, uh, fleeting. It is only a breath. It's only a moment. But what I have come to give you is something of pure joy, peace, fulfillment, knowing very well that you are not the same person that you used to be, but you are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ himself. I just love the fact, the way the gospel works. Are you ready for this weird little twist? Are you ready for this? God became a human being when the second person, the Trinity, the Son of God became Jesus so that we as human beings can become more and more like God. What can the world offer that's any better than that? Let me remind you what Paul said in Romans. 
He said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. Little qualifier there, right? The more you trust him, the more you will be filled so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You know, I wish you all great joy. I mean that, I really do. And I hope that through that joy, through the rigors of this transforming experience, through this idea of being in the world that is so full of things that will tear you apart, in this world that gives you nothing but struggle, the path that you have chosen is the narrow way. I actually hope that through following Jesus through all this, you would not only have joy, peace, contentment, fulfillment, but I hope you'll be happy along the way through him, that which will last forever. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask us all to pray together. And honestly, I can't tell you how to pray on this. All I can do is ask you to look inside your heart and ask yourself, what makes me happy? What would make me happy today? Now, some people might say, I wish I'd win the lottery. That would make me happy. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe what would make me happy today is sharing the good news of Jesus with a loved one so they can be with you forever. As we pray today, I'm going to lead us off. I'm just going to pray in my own heart. But if the words that I say are really what's going on in your own heart, claim them as your own. Let's pray together. Oh, most gracious and holy Lord Jesus, oh, God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. And Lord, I would pray that as you pour out your spirit upon us and continually change us, oh Lord, that we would shift our focus of happiness away from the world and onto the cross. That we would shift our focus of happiness not among the material things uh, that are continually shifting and molding and disappearing, but upon the eternity of heaven. Lord, I would pray that we would focus in on the most important thing and choose you over whatever the world has to offer so that we may truly be with you and receive your full joy. We thank you and praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.